Hey everybody, Timo here. This episode is part of the Gitcoin Climate Solutions series. Please head on over to gitcoin.basin.global, check out our grant for the round, and then click back to grants and you will see all the awesome climate projects. There are 40 individual projects and 10 bundles. This Gitcoin Climate Round is funding $333,000 of matching funds to all these awesome climate projects. So please support them. And welcome to the episode. Hey, everybody. Timo here. I'm here with Pranav from the Five by South. Hi, Pranav. Hi, Timo. Th- thanks for being here. My pleasure. It's an honor, frankly. You know, this, I've, I've been waiting for this. Yes. To be speaking with you. But b- before we came on, we were, uh, we were admiring each other's mustaches. So we can do some of that. Totally. Maybe we can run a poll, right? In terms of, yeah, which one is like, coming out better. Yeah. Good. Well, I have YouTube going and LinkedIn going. So if people have questions, you can chat at either place or they can come over to basin.live. But uh, while I'm doing some technical stuff, Pranav, why don't you go ahead and tell everyone about Refi by South? And you are a leader in the Refi movement. And it's nice to have some friends across the globe. It's 1130 p.m. where you are. It's 11 in the morning here in Colorado. So it's cool to uh, be doing a global for climate nature, carbon impact. So come, please yeah, give us a rundown on what you're doing. Thank you so much. Firstly, thank you so much for having me here. A huge shout out to you for the good work that you do and the example that you set for all of us. No question about that. But about myself, I'm speaking to you from Mumbai, India. I have a background in sustainability in family business and my own garment manufacturing unit for almost like 15 years. I've been in the sustainable space since 2012, 13 uh, because of the sort of shift from the family business to the entrepreneurship thought process. In sustainability, I got into the startup ecosystem. Along my journey, I have run an accelerator. I've worked with uh, different angel ecosystems as a mint. I've been part of India's first circular fashion firm, been part of a plastic traceability and transparency, been part of a crypto. And yeah, as you can see, my journey essentially brought me closer and closer to blockchain. And uh, essentially, I then just saw this huge, frankly, an opportunity. And the first time I saw it, it was literally just an opportunity, right? The climate is definitely a challenge, but it's also an opportunity and blockchain lends itself so well to this climate problem. I just sort of for it and I fell down the rabbit hole, been down there since one and a half years. We for myself came about as my being part of uh, Law Labs. So Law, Law Labs, just a quick shout out to Dave, a great friend, even better leader, frankly, and just putting together this amazing kick-ass team of people across the globe. And one of the things that really came out of Law Labs was that need to be going, giving first is the principle. And that's a challenge that I faced when I was from the global side. Uh, because frankly, most of the conversations, most of the things that were happening were on time zones, which were not really suitable for the South. So I started out really with that objective, started out with really pulling these conversations into the global South. I did a bunch of Twitter spaces in the start of 2022. I then realized that oh, it's not necessary for the Twitter spaces to be only in English. And so that's the sort of second part of uh, where Arifa by South started out with is to literally localize refi conversations. Just enabling refi ambassadors and asking them to do Twitter spaces in their home countries, in the local languages, just just making leaders, enabling leaders, the leadership quality in them, right? So that's something that we've done. We also realized along the way that COVID was over. It was time for people to really come together in a room. And in India, refi was pretty much an alien. So a, a bunch of us projects, about seven of us got together and did India's first refi summit. We had 100 mm-hmm. plus people attend. We had 15 plus speakers, including folks from the climate change space. These are people who are doing impact projects on ground. So these are not like three, but two impact projects. who are just curious about how technology can help them. We had 10 plus projects thinking about the work that they're doing in ReFi, in India. So see, and actual work, actual projects, some of them actually working with state governments, although they don't call themselves ReFi. It's like purely technology helping address climate change. But yeah, those projects are definitely there. And then we lastly, we also had VCs. And believe it or not, they were interested. They're listening. They're learning all the time. And we had a cat which owned the place. We did this event in a factory which had been repurposed into a creative space. So there was like an organic garden. There was aquaponics. And there were cats roaming around the place, owning the space, frankly. And we were just blessed. I think the energy from the space itself put all of us in that zone that we've all come here to build, to collaborate. So that, well, that's been another milestone in the Refi by South journey. Going forward, have like plans, a lot of them around education, 
And that's around really onboarding perhaps the next billion to Web3. And again, not necessarily in English, but in the local languages. We have uh, thoughts, we have plans around discovery, really surfacing a lot of these impact projects, which would, would be really helped by these Web3 wrappers, which would enable them to make business models, size their impact, and connect to corporates and, and businesses and governments who are looking to have these data points around impact and fund such people who are doing impactful work. So that's like the discovery part of it. And then there's, of course, this whole interoperability part of it. You'll be surprised, you know, chains in India, there are L1s in India are still, who are doing refi projects, right? So there's like, and that's like mind-blowing, right? The question that arises is, do we need another L1? We have plenty, right? Getting people to think about this before they again try to build out the entire tech stack, right? From the L1 to the DAP. Tell them, you know what, there's a lot of work being done already. You can potentially stand on the shoulders of giants and look further, get to market faster, that is better rather than just trying to reinvent the wheel every time. You know? And it doesn't have to belong to you. It's commons, it's climate, it affects us all. And there's big enough a pie for all of us to really take. So that's Repi by South. Really want to touch people in the global South, bring their voice to the fore, discover projects, help them scale, and ensure there's interoperability in them. Cool. Well, I love the approach. Global, right? Starts local. And I, I love the approach. Time zone, culture, barriers. It's You're very influential and you're very active and you're working super hard, you're, you're up in the middle of the night, you're up early in the morning, done with people around the world. So kudos to you and everything you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cool. Yeah, you're welcome. Just to zoom out a little bit, we are using the word refi, right? Regenerative finance. Over the last year and a half through your journey, wh wh have you settled on a definition or I ask you today, it's your definition of refi in, in a couple of sentences. To be honest with you, I am a salesman, so I'll usually make sure that I get the person to buy refi. And I tell him what he wants to hear. The truth of it is, <laughs> the truth of it is, you know, that personally inside, I believe technology itself lends very well. And I could call it different names, right? So for example, I'll essentially talk about refi being a better version of DeFi. I'll talk about the fact that every chain in the short term will have their climate hero projects because if in capital in every chain, whether it is Polygon or Ethereum, or any other chain that you can think of. There'll always be these people who want to do good with their money, want to do good with uh, the tokens. So they'll gravitate towards projects which are doing good, which potentially could be climate projects. So you'll have, they're not the DeFi folks, they're not the DGENs, they're not just chasing returns, they're chasing impact. So as opposed to those DeFi, we have these refi in every chain, right? So that's like one version of what I really offer to people. The other bit that I offer, of course, is regenerative finance and the fact that it's really about enabling ecosystems, just adding to them rather than being an extractive system. That's the other definition that I give. And then, of course, as a last, I just offer to them that, again, in all probability, this is just an acronym that Gregory came up with or you came up with. And that's just the truth of it, right? It's a refi. But yeah, those are the three versions that I offer. I think, you know, the fact that blockchain offers collaboration at scale, it offers trust in a trustless environment. It enables decentralization. It just empowers folks on the first mile. A lot of times you'll hear people talking about the last mile. People refer to waste collectors as the last mile or people refer to folks who are attending to rivers or people, the farmers as the last mile. To me, it's not the last mile. It's the first mile, right? They are the ones who are really at the edge of it, right? So blockchain really enables us to empower a lot of these first mile, right? Because by the fact that you can collect data points at origin, without human intervention, probably through IoT. So you can be assured of the trust, traceability, transparency. And then you can do wonders with those data points. You can definitely monetize them. That's the low-hanging fruit, likely. But it's the analysis that you do on it, right? How do you resource, how do you allocate resources based on those data points? How do you let those data points inform you? That's where the potential opportunity lies. But for us as private entrepreneurs, for the governments for sure, if they can get themselves to see it, but yeah, that's three, five, four. Months. I love the first mile, last mile, the way to look at the opposite ends of the spectrum. What, what came to mind for me, Pranav, is like upstream, downstream, right? Of like our actions, right? Affect someone downstream and eventually it comes in a cycle. So I love that. Absolutely. Cool. So I'm just uh, shared your grant links here in these spaces or the, the Basin Live interviews. This is being streamed out to YouTube, streamed out to LinkedIn. We're recording these. They're going to be posted back to an edited version on YouTube and, uh, and uh, podcast, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatnot. One of the goals, well, we're here for 
Gitcoin climate round, the Gitcoin alpha round, which has been instrumental in Basin's journey over the last year. Gitcoin has funded at this point almost 70 million in what goods funding, real million for climate. This round specifically, we're testing out new software, new protocol. There's $333,000 up for matching funds for these approximately 50, 60 projects in the climate round. For me, one of the big goals right now in, in, with the events of last year of FTX and SBF and Terra collapse and whatnot is like Web3, crypto, blockchain, bad, right? It's like scam, people just it, and whatnot. But it's like those people building real tools, creating real solutions for the climate crisis, the nature crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the income inequality crisis, whatnot. So would you say to the audience, rather than being in our echo chamber, right? We, we talked about earlier on the Twitter space of like our echo chamber of refi and Web3, like what would you say to people on LinkedIn who are watching who don't know about these things? What are your thoughts? I got a simple filter for them. And it's, it's as beautiful as it is simple. Every refi project and every project that they see, which claims to be refi, would necessarily have data points originating in the real world. That's the filter. Every climate project, every impact project would be picking up data points from the real world. It's not like money moving between wallets. It's actually data points that we're picking up, bringing on chain, and then essentially putting on them, right? And these could, these could be weather data points. It can be soil. These could be soil data points, which will decide, okay, whether the carbon credits can be generated out of those particular data points, right? These could be impact data points, which show whether a particular work has been done. Literally, your beach has been cleaned up, right? And those data points, by virtue of them being collected at the point of origin, bought on chain, in transparent, trustless method, can lend themselves to a lot of authenticity, integrity, veracity. And by doing so, they can remove the gatekeepers. We can lower the costs. Simply the technology, of course, of course lowers the cost, but also because when you remove this whole requirement of a verification, this third-party person who comes in and says, you know what, you are doing good, but now when I say you're doing good, then you're really doing good. So that, and it costs a lot of money to do that, right? And the moment you have this entire data points originating in real life, being bought on chain, trust being established there, those costs can be removed. And now suddenly you have a very different business model, which lends itself very well for action to be taken by individuals, companies, governments. And a good example that I give to people, they question me too much about it, is about plastic waste in India, right? And there is a certain type of plastic poly bags which have been banned in India. And if you can think about it, right, very difficult in a country like India to ban something because there's usually this challenge about if you ban something, people's livelihood will get hurt and how will they survive? And it's a very touchy topic. But then at a certain point, the government, everybody realizes plastic is just choking all of us. So then they decide to say, you know what, we'll stop this. And that particular quality of plastic disappears because it just stops. The government puts the foot down. So there's definitely the play about statutory angle coming in. There's definitely the play about empowering the stewards and there's definitely the opportunity for us as entrepreneurs to put together these use cases and to build these businesses. To me, I definitely come in with the lens of a business and I would not touch it if there were not a business model around it. And I'm pretty sure there's a definite business model around all of the work that we do in ReFi. And if you're not seeing it, well, we just need to dig deeper because there's definitely a customer buying where we are selling for the work that we're doing. You come back to the, the salesman in you. I've sold for too many years. Yeah. What, what comes to mind, Pranav, when you say that about like increased efficiencies, lower costs, we're talking earlier this week with the network and cooperatives, like people are happier doing their jobs when they have an ownership stake in things that, that they're building something that they're a part of, like a movement. Dave always says from Lolo Labs, but what comes to mind is I think it's the blockchain 50 Forbes does every year. And it's like if people, people question me about like Web3 and crypto and blockchain, I say, just look at that from March of last year. And I'm excited to see what this year, those are some of the biggest corporations, biggest supply chain companies, the shipping companies, the insurance companies using blockchain underneath the hood to do those things, increased efficiencies, lower cost. And I feel like this little rabbit hole that we're in over here is trying to do the same thing for regeneration, restoration, conservation, whatnot. Absolutely. Completely hear you. Really, really. So that, that so resonates with me. And that's the interesting part of it, right? You would have heard so much about India being anti-crypto and all of that stuff. I can tell you for the fact that there are governments in India, state governments in India, right? You're working with projects which are 
addressing climate change. They could be bringing water credits on board. They are talking about mapping soil quality, right? And these are like projects which are being funded and started off and collaborated with by state governments. So it's just a lot of it has also got to do with the narrative. The moment we talk about specifically around tokenization, crypto, in our own little world away from the government, it kind of presses a lot of wrong buttons. But it's frankly the point we are at as an industry. We are just better served by saying, you know what, it's blockchain, climate, climate blockchain. And climate is a is one of the best use cases for blockchain. That's what we do. You know, it's leveraging technology. And we've been leveraging technology for the longest time now. Nobody has a problem with that. So I think to me, that's always the approach. That's how I literally sell it. And yeah, I know of multiple projects. And I wouldn't say they're they like in hundreds. Because we are definitely out there in the lead. Because there's this gap around, frankly speaking, you know, we don't even see the problem right now. Climate is not really a problem for a lot of people. And that's weird, right? We're pretty sure in the next one or two years, the insurance guys are going to be the first to really pick this up because they're going to hike insurance premium across the board for all the places, for all the categories which are going to get affected by climate. And that's when businesses are going to realize because insurance is going to go through the roof. And then they'll suddenly realize, oh shit, we haven't done something about it. This is the time to do something about it. Yeah to, yeah, to me, it comes back to risk. And what, you know, that's something we're core to what we're doing at Basin is how do you make risk investable and who holds the risk in a certain area, country, town. At the end of the day, banks, insurance companies, like you said, governments. I asked my daughter, my youngest daughter, the other day we were driving and we were talking about climate risk. And I, I said, well, you know, who holds the risk? And she thought about it for a minute and she goes, all of us. Like we, we all have climate risk one way or the other, whether you're invested in a company, whether you own a business, whether you donate to a philanthropy, whether you hike on a trail, whether you go swimming in the ocean, whether you travel across the world, like there's risk for all of us. So it's like, how do we, you, know, you were talking about incentives, like how do we change the incentives around it or the plastic waste, like you, you mentioned, for example, like how do, you know, how do we create a positive outcome, a non-extractive outcome for that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the plastic problem in India, for example, has been addressed by what we call the extended producer responsibility policy. And I, since I was part of that business for some time, I just love that concept about how a small amount of money coming in as EPR can really set up a chain reaction. It can create that demand for plastic to be pull, pulled off the streets, right? Like a chain reaction. And you suddenly have like just the effects getting amplified through the supply chain with, of course, a little bit of statutory government push. But really just solving and addressing a huge problem in the entire country, right? About waste. So yeah, there's what, lots what, what, of... Could you call that the extended supply chain or... Extended, extended... responsibility, EPR. So that's the policy around very particular kind of waste called multi-layered packaging. That's one of the worst kinds of plastic. It's your lace wrappers, your Pepsi Coke covers, which is like a mix of plastic and paper, or it's multiple layers of plastic with paper in between. That's, you know, not really recycle it. It has to be incinerated. So the government in India has made it mandatory that you put out whatever the FMCG majors, you know, Hindustan levers, the Unilevers of the world, whatever you put out into a market in a particular state. So assume you put out 20,000 tons in a particular state. You've got to give money to bring all of that packaging back. And that's like a statutory requirement. You can't escape that. So if you're putting plastic into the environment, you have to compulsorily pay for it to be recovered back. And at the moment, it's not like a very high price, right? Because in India, labor is cheap. There's just so many of us, right? But what it does is it sets up a chain reaction, right? Number one, companies start looking how to avoid this. It becomes like this tax that they want to avoid. So they start looking for alternatives. And number two, even if they have to put it out, they start building out these inward supply chains to pull off all of that plastic back from the environment. Because, you know, they escape it. If I find a Unilever wrapper on the road in a city, I'm pretty sure Unilever put it out there. And your unit never is responsible for it, right? It's got its name on it. So that extended producer responsibility is a great use case for carbon. It's um, not a use case as a, as a role model for carbon. There's lots of lessons. World over, we can learn from how plastic is being managed. I'm not saying plastic management is a success story. Your challenge is out there. It's definitely further up in the learning curve than we are in the carbon conversation and the ecosystem credit conversation. It's... I'm going to find the link here, but uh, I've always thought, like you've mentioned, the Unilever wrapper, the Doritos wrapper, whatever you're walking down the street, like a, a cigarette or Budweiser can or Coca-Cola can. To me, why isn't that like a marketing or there should be some sort of tokenized like incentive around like that company that, yeah, they made it for the consumer, but 
Seth Godin, one of my favorite authors, speakers, whatnot, had one of his podcasts, he talked about the, in the U.S., we had the campaign back before I was born, right? Don't be a litter bug. It was basically, and he did some research on it regarding that, like the big corporations, the consumer packaged good corporations were behind that campaign that basically shifted that responsibility to consumers of like, hey, you don't litter. It's your trash. Like you need to pick it up. It's not Budweiser's trash or Coca-Cola's trash or Unilever's trash or whatnot. I think there's something there in what you're talking about. And and like you mentioned carbon, right? Like carbon is a waste product and whoever's creating the waste product, I'd argue it's me driving my truck or whatever. It's like, but it's like, where did the waste actually originate? Like, you know, waste came in that scope one, two, and three supply chain to actually that. I hear you. So let me tell you one example, which really blows people's mind. Let's uh, share it with them, right? And this is around circular economy. So to me, a lot of these companies, at least the smart ones, are already picking on this and literally putting this out as a customer loyalty program. And if you think about it, a circular economy is like a giant customer loyalty program, right? So if I'm a company and I'm selling something to you, if I'm telling you, you know what, when you're done with it, just give it back to me. What am I doing out here? I'm closing the loop and I'm going to obviously give you some incentive for doing that. And I've got you hooked for life right? because you're going to come back to me always. It's like a loyalty program and I've got you for keeps. It's almost like the, the old milk jugs, right? Or the, I grew up in, in Michigan here in the U.S. and we always had 10% or 10 cent deposit on every single bottle and can. And there was people in, in college or whatever that made a living collecting those cans. And he, even if the consumer actually didn't return them, like there was value in that. So it's, I, I like that, the circular closing the loop. Absolutely. Well, what are the next steps for refi South? I, I've shared your grant link. I'll share it here again in the comments. But, uh, the next steps for you and what your project. For the next three months, there's definitely scaling up the refi ambassador program, just getting more people out there, enabling them, incentivizing them to do Twitter spaces in the local languages or even events where they can. And uh, definitely being has been supported by refi spring in this. There's an event coming up where we are doing a hackathon, a refi hackathon, India's first refi hackathon a location which is a pilot location for a refi project in India. And again, we want to bring in climate change makers from the Web2 space, from the impact space. We want to bring in developers, founders and investors and just get them a curated 100 people group to work on problems in real world settings. So that's like coming up in March. And then, yeah, just further out from there, we are, we have some very interesting collaborations in the pipeline, talking to some major players in the in starting off with the Indian ecosystem. In terms of, okay, how do we enable project discovery, right? There's just lots of projects which are doing good work. How do we enable? What was the ecosystem you said? The near? What ecosystem did you say? Multiple ecosystems. So there's a bunch of local ownership ecosystems, web free entrepreneurship groups. There's like Biddler Strive. There's Founders HQ. And uh, there's a bunch of them. There's the product house. And they all are like large communities and partnering them. We are collaborating with them. And that's like in India. And then of course, there's in Singapore and multiple other organizations we're reaching out. So that's around project discovery. And then of course, going forward, there's the interoperability bit. So then there are these conversations we're having with AWS in terms of, okay, how can we really collect all of these different use cases which are in India and just make a case study book or case study presentation out of that to showcase that, you know what, this is the this is how blockchain technology is being leveraged for climate action. As simple as that. Blockchain technology leveraged for climate action, right? Show use cases. And then that suddenly opens up a lot of possibilities. So that's like education, it's project discovery, it's enabling this interoperability between different projects. Right, so that all of that, it, it's like trajectory, if I can call it, starting off with education around discovery and then interoperability. So next three months, there's definitely education and discovery happening. It reminds me, uh, you probably already talked to Climate Collective or Ron. He showed me a project he's working on yesterday, basically a Git book for e- exactly that. And it's a collaborative project, basically a three climate like book. So all the stuff you just mentioned, you should definitely get with Nirvan and add this, you know, the best, the practices. He's looking at solution patterns, which I love the concept of what are the solutions and then what people do with it, what they will. Absolutely. So Nirvan is coming to India in February and yeah, we do to catch up. 
definitely. Cool. Cool. Well, so much for all the work you're doing in refi and climate, organizing on the ground, global organization, time zone, language differences. Yeah, I love the energy and enthusiasm you bring. So thanks for coming. Love that. Thank you so much. And at a certain point, I do have an ask of you. At a certain point, I would definitely want to do this the other way, but I want to hear more about you, you know, where you're talking. And obviously I follow a lot of the work that you do. So I do that. But I think there's definitely a case to be made for all of us to learn more about you. For sure. I, uh, I owe it to you to stay up late one night. I'm kind of a night owl anyways. You just let me know and I'll, we'll figure it out. And I just have to, I talk loud. So my kids and wife don't want to hear me uh, talking in the middle of the night. But I, I can go out to the, the workshop in the garage or something. So <laughs> Absolutely. Love that. Thank you for having cool. me. Yeah, cool. Well, welcome to stick around. But if you don't mind just switching over to the, the Basin Live link as an audience member and uh, we'll welcome Kyle Absolutely. to the show. Thank you, Pranav. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You have to make sure to add it to your final ballot. Please make a donation to every single one. It doesn't matter how big or how small it is. It's more about the number of votes and the number of donations that counts because that's what engages quadratic funding. This Gitcoin climate round is funding $333,000 of matching funds to all these awesome climate projects. So please support them.